This Jurassic tale starts in the summer of 1992, less than a year until an incident closed down the original Jurassic Park before it had even opened its doors. Having arrived at their destination, both John Hammond and Benjamin Lockwood got out of the Jeep. Swinging almost identical amber-tipped wooden canes on every other step, both men followed a guide showing them around. Men at work all around them at the construction site as they walked up the stairs of the visitor centre and through an enormous doorless entry. From the empty roofless main hall, they walked on, through a mostly empty tour vehicle garage on the right, to get to the stairs which were situated at the back of the building. Another red and white jeep came speeding into the garage, and Robert Muldoon, Hammond's game warden, quickly parked and jumped out, walking straight up to this party of three. Good, Mr Hammond, you're here. I'd like to talk to you about one of the raptors, uh, the new one we added the other day. She's shown a lot of aggression. We think she has killed one of the others. Robert, not now, not here. I'll be with you after. John signalled the guide to continue, and they quickly moved on, leaving Muldoon standing, watching as they left. They moved up the stairs and walked down the greyish concrete hallway. The control room will be behind these circular windows on the right. The guide explained. And here, they're building the showroom laboratory with a secured embryo vault. All of the rooms were completely empty, nothing but undressed concrete. We could bring eggs over or develop a selection of embryos we can store here. So visitors can even watch them hatch in front of their eyes if they're lucky. Can we make sure that happens when we bring investors over? I guess. You should ask Dr. Wu, it's not my department. They arrived at another doorless exit at the end of the short hallway. Now, if we step through here, this will be an emergency exit for the introductory ride. From the strange half-moon shaped room, they could see into both the showroom and the control room. And as they continued to move on, the guide explained further. Glass walls will separate the visitors from the rooms. They'll pass them on one of three seat stages we plan to install here. The stages will move over and underneath each other on a cyclic trackway. Visitors will start at the theater here, taking a seat on the first set to watch an introduction on the cloning concept. They'll then start their way past the showroom and the control room to show our park as the state-of-the-art, well-oiled machine it is. Show visitors they're in good hands, if you will. Finally, they'll arrive at the second theater at the end, where they'll watch an overview of the park's attractions to get them hungry for more. While the first group is watching the video at the end, the second platform of seats will have come up from the floor, with the third somewhere halfway. So a second group of visitors can start watching the cloning video. That way we bring down wait times between rides and we can serve two groups of visitors at a time. If you follow me to the recording stage we've set up, I'll tell you more about your part of the cloning video that introduces Dr. DNA, this cartoon character here on the cover. This is the script. We'll animate him in later. I uh, like the, the colors, but I'm not so sure about the letters. Those are the first letters that make up the four components of DNA. Yes, I, uh, I see that, but, uh, but I uh, think it makes the animation a bit messy. Can we uh, lose the letters? I think so. I'll tell the animators. What if you just show eyes, eyebrows and mouth, and lose the nose and this big bulb-like head shape? <laughs> yes, I, I like that. And let's call him Mr. DNA. Not Doctor. Sounds closer to the public. Less complicated. That is his role, correct? To uh, explain, in layman's terms, what we have done here. Yes, right. Okay. Sure, I'll pass it on. Right, this is the recording studio. That green screen at the back will be replaced with this plaque of the park's logo in stone. Oh, that looks nice. You walk up those stairs to this mark here, and you talk to that point over there. That's where you will be at the time the video is shown to the audience. We need to be present at every screening? That can't be right. We've got more to do than just entertain visitors here all day. Don't worry. These are for special occasions. We'll record the same script with the other presenters too. Most of it will be animation without live environments. But if you keep to the marks, the animation overlay will match perfectly for all our live actors. <laughs> Hear that, Benjamin? We've made it. We're actors now. John Hammond looked through the script, which didn't contain many lines. The idea is your off-screen self acts as if you take a bit of blood from your on-screen self. That's a, a lot of hello your names. Yeah, 
will record you stepping sideways from those marks in a few takes and in the end result on screen it will look like you are cloned five times. The clones greeting each other. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, <laughs> Dr. DNA, uh, where, where did you come from? Oh, so I uh, scratched that. Mr. DNA. It says here that it takes the gene sequences minutes to break down the DNA strand. Isn't that a lie? That's what we said too, when Dr. Wu suggested to change it. It originally read within a year or even months, but he thought that didn't sound impressive. He said not to think of it as a lie, just prepared for the future. That with the system's learning and the speed of technological advances, it will be true in a few years. Uh, quite right. And uh, technically, it is still minutes. Just uh, a lot of them. Well, alright. I'll give you a moment to practice the lines and we'll be back in a moment. About 15 minutes later, the guide returned. He turned to Lockwood. Mr. Lockwood. I've been asked to tell you there's an urgent call for you, which you can take in the conference room down the hall at the end. Ben? I don't know. Alright, Mr. Hammond, if you take your starting position down the stairs. Too bad, I, I, I don't have my new cane yet. Don't worry, most people won't notice. A few shots later, and a worker arrived on the set. Mr. Hammond? Yes? Mr. Lockwood's asked me to let you know he's sorry, but he's had to go. His daughter, she and her husband, were involved in an accident. Oh, my, uh, of course. Well, I, I hope they're all right. I don't know, sir. In the winter of that same year, John Hammond entered the gateway of a graveyard. With his amber-tipped bone cane, he walked for a thin layer of snow to someone that he had witnessed growing up. From young boy to the man that now sat there, down on his knees, staring at the face of death. Not his own, but that of his daughter. Benjamin Lockwood had his eyes locked on the tombstone that covered his daughter's grave. She had been put to rest months earlier, taking his place in the ground next to his wife. Out of respect, John had brought flowers too and laid them down on the grave in front of Lockwood, next to the red roses Benjamin still rested his hands on. Not looking up, Lockwood started talking. His voice was flat. No more tears left to cry. She was way too young. Did you know I was going to be a grandfather? She was pregnant. John put his hand on his friend's shoulder. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Benjamin. I really am, but it's, it's been months. It's time to let her go. They're not coming back. Looking back up over his shoulder, Lockwood slowly got up. You know, I've been thinking a lot, even more so, these past few weeks. It's time for you to put your mind to use again at the park, Benjamin. We are closing in on opening our doors. And now Muldoon insists on that we move the raptors from the park into our pen to better keep an eye on them. They'll start building that soon now the, the visitor centre is almost finished. We've been setting up operations and the first tracks have been laid down for the tour. And the first tour vehicles have arrived. You'll love them, Benjamin. So much going on that I, I could use your help with. We brought dinosaurs back. Yes, the, the dinosaurs. We can bring my daughter back too. Slowly, Lockwood removed a small baggie from his jacket pocket and held it up in the light, revealing a thick brown lock of hair. I found this in the photo album of her. Next to this old photo. He showed John an old yellowing picture of his daughter from when she was about 10 years old, standing with her nanny, Iris. It's hers, her hair from when she was a little girl. My little girl's DNA. I understand what you're thinking, Benjamin. Uh, think about what you're saying. I have. I don't think you can understand it. Your daughter still lives. You are a grandfather. I can still be a grandfather to my own blood too. No, 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 Ben. Uh, cloning dinosaurs is one thing. But cloning humans? No. Only a few months ago you chuckled at the thought. You called it funny. But now that I want to bring my own daughter back, you are against it? 
What's the difference between a dinosaur and a human? Dinosaurs are animals. Humans are mammals? Come on, Ben. The minds of dinosaurs are not nearly as complicated. We're still not sure about that. The raptors? They are a new species on this planet that have no rights of their own. I, I, I can't even begin to think what uh, complications a human would bring. You'd have to register them and they need education. And then on top of that, you don't even have the energy or strength to raise a child on your own. I've thought it all through, John. I'm determined. You can't stop me on this. And I'm sorry, Ben. I, I truly am. But I, I can't let you do this. Not in the name of our company. I can't allow you to go back to Sornal or, or Nublar with this purpose. You disappoint me. I thought you were my friend. You are more than that to me. You're like my little brother, Benjamin. John, you and I both know you left your real brothers, your family, behind in Scotland, as my brother left my family. That's not fair. I left them because I can take care of my own, giving them one less mouth to feed. Still, you left. I never left you, did I? Benjamin, I'm doing this to protect you. You are wrong in this. You're in pain, and you're not thinking clearly. You'll change your mind. It's not too late. I'm sure that you'll come to see that I'm right. I won't, but don't worry. I understand you have interest to protect too. I'll be okay. It's not like that. It's fine. I won't do it under InGen's flag. Even though I'd have every right to do so, I'll find a way around. If it takes me all I have, I'll find a way. Benjamin. Thank you for the flowers, John. As Benjamin Lockwood turned and walked away, snow began to fall, and John Hammond realised he was on his own again. Even if Benjamin wouldn't come around, John was used to being on his own. His life had been like that many times before, and he had always found his way. It would be five years later, in 1997, shortly before John Hammond died, with InGen on the verge of following John to his grave, that they would finally meet again, one last time, in the hospital where they were taking care of John. That day, they talked about many things. Hammond's past and InGen's future. What would become of the dinosaurs? For one separate issue, which John had expected to come up, he had invited Dr. Henry Wu earlier that day. Now, seeing how determined his old friend still was after all those years, he was certain. And when Dr. Wu finally knocked on the door, John beckoned him in. John? Mr. Lockwood. How are you doing, sir? It's been a while. It certainly has, Henry. You've done well, I hear. Congratulations on that flower they named after you. Henry Wu smiled. Thank you, yes. Henry, thank you for coming. Ben, I, uh, I uh, thought this would be best if Henry could hear this from me too. What is it, John? I uh, wanted to let you know that since you've still been trying after all these years, I'm okay to let Henry decide for himself if he wants to help you or not. I won't hold it against you if you ask him. Ask me what? John, are you sure? Yes. From his jacket, Benjamin Lockwood took out the small baggie with his daughter's hairs, which had never left his side. Only the number of hairs had thinned out, greatly reduced over the past years in desperate attempts to extract his daughter's DNA. Benjamin looked at Henry, who looked back and forth between Hammond and Lockwood, confused by the situation. What is this about? What do you think about cloning a human? I know it's frowned upon. It seems the majority of people say it shouldn't be allowed. I didn't ask what you hear people say, I asked what you think about it. This. This is my daughter's DNA. Cautiously, Henry Wu looked at the baggie in Lockwood's hands. He already knew the sad history of Benjamin's daughter. I was a father. I was going to be a grandfather. Just like that, in the blink of an eye, that was taken away from me. I'm too old to be a father now. I can see that. But I can be a grandfather. I've tried the past five years to extract DNA from my daughter's hairs but I have not been successful. I've grown careful not to spend all the hairs on the effort. Will you help me? I think... I know it can be done, but... Henry, 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 you don't have to decide here and now. Take your time, think it over. But whatever you decide, I won't stop you. 
that's not it. It's the chance to retrieve DNA from cut hairs is zero to none. Simple crime stories might suggest differently, but it's the truth. Now, there is another way, but you may not like it. Anything. Intrigued by the prospect, Henry Wu took the challenge to try and fulfill Lockwood's dream, to become a grandfather to his own daughter through the miracle of genetic cloning. As twisted as it sounded when he said it out loud, Henry was convinced that if he didn't do it, someone else would soon enough. And as soon as Lockwood delivered what was needed, Henry got to work on this side project. At the same time, Simon Masrani took over the InGen Corporation, so Wu continued in secret. And when the US House of Representatives passed the Human Cloning Prohibition Act of 2001, he was glad he had. Even though the bill would never pass the Senate, he knew they would get a lot of heat if this news ever came out. He was challenging himself now. The world didn't need to know. He would know he was the first, and that would be enough. Henry's time would be more and more consumed by other priorities, as Masrani moved closer to opening the doors of a new park. Still, he continued, slowly making progress. One failed attempt at a time, to make sure that Lockwood would not be put to that impossible choice of which clone to keep. Until, more than three years after Jurassic World had opened its doors, and Wu's responsibilities had moved into calmer waters, Henry could finally send out that message. The one that Benjamin Lockwood had been longing for. A cloned embryo of his daughter's DNA had finally reached a stage in its ectogenesis chamber from which birth was now almost certain. After all that time, waiting at his estate in Northern California, what had been his dream for almost 17 years was about to become a reality. Nearing the four year anniversary of the park, in 2009, she was, for lack of a better word, born. Benjamin Lockwood gave her the name his wife had wanted to give their daughter, now already over 40 years ago. They had decided on a different name back then, but their grandchild would carry this name from that day forward. Amazing.